hemophilia A and hemophilia B. Hemophilia A is a decrease in factor 8 and hemophilia B hemophilia B is decreasing factor 9. Hemophilia A is decreasing factor 8 and hemophilia B is decreasing factor 9, which is also known as a Christmas factor. Hemophilia is mostly found in men because it is extremely recessive in contrast with ITP, which is mostly found in women. So in hemophilia, men are mostly infected and women are carriers. Now remember that I told you that hemophilia is deep bleeding. So how does the patient present? So presentation mostly depends on how much factor this patient is deficient, is lacking. So if the patient has 25% of the factors, let's say, at, let's say out of 100% of factor A, the patient has greater than 25%, this patient will have mild presentation. So the patient will not really show any symptoms. The patient will really show symptoms during trauma. But let's say out of the 100% of factor A, this patient only really has less than 5%. This patient will present with a lot of symptoms, spontaneous bleeding, which is deep. So bleeding in the joints, hematrosis, bleeding in um, of, like in other parts like hematomas, so on and so forth. So the bleeding is deep. How do you diagnose? What the diagnostic criteria, please. The first thing is family history. Yes, you need to check the history and see if this ex this excellent uh, recessive pattern. Yes, or they will tell you that maybe the uncle had it before, something like that. Then the next diagnostic criteria is prolonged PPT and normal PT. What does this mean? Okay, so prolonged PP, PTT, not PPT. Prolonged PTT is for the intrinsic pathway and prolonged PT is for the intrinsic pathway, as you can see. And in hemophilia A and B, you can see that deficiency of factor Eight and deficiency of factor nine, right? As you can see that this is factor nine here. And you can see that this is factor eight. So that you can see that's why there's an ele elevation of PTT, right? Good. If a patient has, let's say, deficiency of factor seven, the elevation of PT and PTT will be normal. That is a very important point that the teacher will ask you. Okay, good. So that's why the patient will have prolonged P, P, PTT and normal PT. Now, again, diagnostic criteria, family history. Number two, prolonged PTT, so correct disease should be PTT and normal PT that corrects its mixing study. What is the mixing study? So what happens is when we take a patient's blood for coagulation profile and we find that the patient has a prolonged PTT and normal PT. We take a control study and we mix it together. So it's like a normal healthy person and we mix it together. Yes. And then when we check the PTT, it would go back to normal. So this is positive and this is indicative of hemophilia. Now, this is very important. The next thing I'm going to ask you is, okay, let me quickly finish the diagnostic criteria. So number one, family history. Number two, prolonged PTT a normal PT that corrects with missing study. And number three is normal von Willebrand factor and INR. So once you see this, you have automatically diagnosed hemophilia, but you still don't know whether it's hemophilia A or hemophilia B. That's what the teacher asks you. How do you know that it's hemophilia A and it is hemophilia A or hemophilia B? So you need to measure factor eight and factor nine in the patient's blood. So you need to measure factor eight or factor nine, and whichever one is decreased, you're able to put your diagnosis. Okay, now treatments, quickly I'll do treatment. During treatment in, uh, in, for hemophilia B, which is deficiency of factor nine, we just replace, this, we just replace in place of factor nine. Now, very important hemophilia A, what will your teacher question you on? If it's mild cases of hemophilia, you can give desmopressin. Yes, you can give desmopressin, but if it's severe to moderate. We cannot give desmopressin. Why? Desmopressin mecha mechanism of action is that it goes to the endothelium of the vessels and it stimulates the release of factor 8. So remember that I told you that the um, presentation of hemophilia depends on the amount of, it, it depends on how much factor is deficient. So can you imagine in a patient that has severe hemophilia that probably has like 2% of factor 8. Can you imagine giving desmopressin to stimulate 
the release of factor eight. What is the patient going to release? Is it the 2% that the patient has? No. So that is why in severe or moderate hemophilia A, we do not give this person. We have to give replacement therapy. We have to give this person factor eight. Understand? Good. But in mild cases, the patient can have like 50% of the normal hemophilia. God. In mild cases, the patient can have 50% of the normal factor eight. So when you give desmopressin, desmopressin can help to release this 50% and that can show improvement. A very important complication that a teacher will ask you during replacement therapy would be um, formation of inhibitors. Why? When you're giving a patient replacement therapy, yes, it's synthetic factor eight or factor nine, depending on which hemophilia you're treating. Your body can make antibodies against these synthetic um, factors. And during treatments, we'll find out that the treatment is not working. So what do you do next? You can give special drugs, but before you give special drugs, you need to test and confirm that um, this patient has this immune, this um, antibodies against the synthetic factors, right? So what are the indications to the inhibitor testing? So when you find out that the patient still has bleeding despite therapy, failure to respond to therapy, and after a lot of exposure to um, synthetic factors, so you need to also test that this patient has not started to develop antibodies against the synthetic factors. What other drugs can you give? The next drug we can give would be emicizumab, E-M-I-C-I-Z-U-M-A-B. So this drug is only given in hemophilia A. So this drug is only given in hemophilia A. You don't give this drug in hemophilia B. And it's also, you can give this drug in a patient that has hemophilia A and has developed antibodies to the synthetic factor eight. Another drug you can give is FIEBA, F-E-I-B-A, and Novo7, right? And Novo7 and FIEBA can be given in a patient that has hemophilia a and hemophilia B, and also can be given in a patient that have developed antibodies to synthetic factor eight and factor nine. So please, you need to know this, the normal coagulation study, right? The normal level of PT is 11 to 15 seconds. PTT is 25 to 40 seconds. INR is 0.9 to 1.1 seconds. Shombin time is less than 24 seconds. Fibrinogen should be 1.5 to 4.5 gram per liter. So let's move into anemia. Anemia is a decreased number of red blood cell or a decreased number of hemoglobin, less than 13.0 gram per deciliter or 130 gram per liter. Again, decrease in hemoglobin less than 13.0 gram per deciliter or 130 gram per liter in men. And in women, it is 12.0 gram per deciliter or 120 gram per liter. And a decrease in hemo hematocrit less than 40 in men and less than 37 in women. How do you classify anemia? By mechanism of action. Anemia can be classified by mechanism of action, like the mechanism, yes, how the anemia occurred. Blood loss, which could be acute or chronic, acute like accidents, right? Like a trauma, chronic like um, a woman that has some gynecological disease, um, ulcer, right? Excessive destruction, so it could be intracorpuscular, which means that the problem is with the red blood cell. So membranopathy, there's a defect in the membrane. So these cells are degraded. Um, yes, it could be due to um, glucose 6-phosphate, dehydrogenase deficiency, or pyruvate kinase. Then extracorpuscular means that the problem is outside the red blood cell, so it's malaria. So malaria is coming from outside and is destroying your red blood cell, right? So on and so forth. Now, another um, uh, according still on that mechanism of action, anemia can occur due to impaired red blood cell production, like in bone marrow suppression, like aplastic anemia. Another classification of anemia is by morphology, yes. Macrocytic is pernicious anemia, folic acid anemia, normocytic, acute blood loss, and hemolytic anemia. Microcytic, iron deficiency anemia, thalassemia, sideroblastic anemia, and anemia caused by lead poisoning. Another um, classification of anemia is by severity. 
mild anemia is when hemoglobin is greater than 90 gram per liter or 9.0 gram per deciliter. Moderate is when the hemoglobin is 70 to 90 gram per liter. Severe is when the hematocrit is less than 70 gram per liter. Now, iron deficiency anemia. Iron deficiency anemia occurs when there's a decrease in iron store. So it's very important for you to know that before a patient presents with iron deficiency anemia, the patient must exhaust the iron stores in the body before a patient presents with iron deficiency anemia. What are the causes? Alimentary, maybe the patient is not eating um, a good source of iron. Chronic bleed, like a woman who is menstruating, a woman who is having like a menstrual disorders, right? Bleeding a lot. Malabsorption, yes, you cannot absorb iron like in celiac sprue, yes, and pregnancy because there's an increased demand for iron. So if the pregnant woman is not taking a lot of iron, how do you diagnose? Very important, please, decrease in ferritin level. It's very important for you to know that ferritin would decrease first before your serum iron would decrease. Also, there will be a decrease in reticulocytes. Why? Because you don't have iron. How can your bone marrow make new red blood cell? Transferring iron binding capacity. Sorry. Transferring iron binding capacity. So I want you to know that ferritin and transferring iron binding capacity, they are like inversely proportional. So when ferritin level decreases, TI, um, TIBC, which is transferring iron binding capacity, will increase. So that's another diagnostic criteria of iron, of, of iron deficiency anemia. Sorry, I also forgot presentation of iron deficiency anemia. How does the patient present? Glossitis, fatigue, pallor, brittleness, picafagia, which means the patient likes to eat ice. It's very important. Another, another diagnostic criteria would be what peripheral smear. What do you see? Microcytic um, form of anemia. Also, when you do like a color index, right, it will be less than um, the normal level. So the normal level of color index is 0 0.85 to 1.0. Yes, yeah, so it will be less than 0 0.85, indicative of iron deficiency anemia. But this iron index is a very old test. How do you treat? Please, very important for you that you must treat the patient until the iron stores are replenished. So first of all, we give oral therapy, yes, ferrous sulfate, three times a day, 200 milligrams, right? And you first give it to treat the anemia so that the patient is not present with any sign of anemia. Then you continue to give this patient um, ferrous sulfate until the iron stores are replenished. Now, you can also give um, parental iron, which could be intravenous, intramuscular, but we only do this when the patient, maybe there's a problem, maybe malabsorption, the patient cannot um, absorb iron through the oral route, so we give it parentally. It's very also important for you to know that Giving iron intravenously does not replenish your iron stores faster. What is the complication of anemia? Check and ask you. So there's nothing known as like demand ischemia. So there's anemia, meaning there's not a lot of blood, and then it is not a lot of blood. Your organs will be in a state of hypoxemia. And when your organs are in a state of hypoxemia, your heart will want to beat faster. Don't forget that your heart is also um, your heart, your heart is also an organ. There's no blood getting to your heart, and your heart is beating faster to solve this um, hypoxemia. It can cause like severe infarction in the heart. So that's one of the complications of anemia. Another thing we need to know it will be iron deficiency would be vitamin B12 deficiency anemia. What are the classification? Pernicious anemia, alimentary form, so on and so forth, right? Now, I want to define something that's very important for you. You need to know that when you hear the term pernicious anemia, pernicious anemia means that this anemia is due to an autoimmune destruction of your gastric parietal cells. Yes, when there's a destruction of your gastric parietal cells, you cannot make intrinsic factor. If you cannot make intrinsic factor, you cannot absorb vitamin B12. If Vitamin B12 deficiency is due to the fact that this patient was not eating food that contained vitamin B12. It is not pernicious anemia. That is very important. 
Okay, if a patient, like there's a treatment known as bariatric surgery. Look at the name here, bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery, yes. When you remove some part of the stomach, like in an obese patient, so that they don't eat a lot. Or if the patient has malabsorption, and then this patient presents with vitamin B12 deficiency. It is not called pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia is when a patient presents with vitamin B12 deficiency because there's an autoimmune destruction of your gastric parietal cell. Okay. Presentation. So, of course, the anemia signs. Peripheral smear, what do you see? Macrocytic um, red blood cell, a big red blood cell. We also see hypersegmented neutrophil, greater than, like, the neutrophil will have greater than four lobes. Yes? Good. Another thing is that we can also see um, in, in pernicious anemia, we can find antibodies to parietal cell or intrinsic factor. The gold standard test to diagnose um, vitamin B12 deficiency anemia is methylmalonic acid. If there's an increase in methylmalonic acid, this is indicative of, of a deficiency of vitamin B12. So, okay, a patient presents to you anemia, yes? You've checked the methylmalonic acid. You are thinking deficiency of vitamin B12, but you need to know what is causing this deficiency of vitamin B12. Now, if you check the blood and you find antibodies to parietal cells, you know that this is pernicious anemia. But if you don't find, you should think that maybe there's malabsorption syndrome, or maybe this patient is not eating well, so you need to ask the patient about the diet. Good. How do you treat? Of course, lifelong therapy, yes. If there's an autoimmune destruction of your of your parietal cells, yes, and your parietal cells are practically dead, you need to give this patient intramuscular injection of vitamin B12, okay? Important point. A plastic anemia. A plastic anemia is pancytopenia. Decrease of red blood cell, decrease of white blood cell, and decrease of thrombocytes, yes? And with the classic presentation, bleeding, infection, and like fatigue, pallor. Classification, congenital, known as Fancon, Fanconi anemia. Fanconi anemia. Acquired, it could be immune or idiopathic. You don't know the cause. But how do you diagnose? Of course, um, peripheral smear. Peripheral smear, you will see like scanty cells. CBC, you found decrease, you find decrease in red blood cell, white blood cell, and thrombocyte. And when you find these, you need to do a bone marrow biopsy. Very important. And then in the bone marrow biopsy, you will not find a lot of cells. It will be dry. Or you can take yellow cells. It's very important for you to know that your bone marrow is not active all the time. So when your bone marrow is not active, it is actually yellow. It contains fatty cells. It's when your bone marrow is activated that it changes to like red and all those things. So bone marrow biopsy, you can find like yellow cells. So indicative of aplastic anemia. Okay, how do you treat treatment of aplastic anemia? You need to give erythropoietin. So EPO, erythropoietin. Example of the drugs, epotein. Okay, so on and so forth. Another treatment will be what? Bone marrow transplant. Okay, what else you need to know? Hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic anemia is, as the name implies, a lysis of red blood cell. Now, you need to know that if a patient presented you anemia, and this anemia occurred during a short period of time, one of the major causes would be acute bleed, like hemorrhages. But if it's hemorrhage, I mean, you can see hemorrhages. Maybe there's an injury. You can see the hemorrhage. Yes. If it's like, Anemia is like acute. It can also be hemolytic. For a patient to present with anemia, if you notice that this anemia took a lot of time to develop, it's a chronic anemia. It's mostly like iron deficiency anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency anemia, yes? Iron deficiency anemia will never occur acutely, yes? It's mostly a chronic process. But if this anemia is acute, this patient was fine like two weeks ago, and all of a sudden you find anemia, you're thinking of either hemorrhage, maybe the patient is bleeding somewhere, or there's hemolysis, there's destruction of your red blood cell, okay? Now, classification could be intracorpuscular and extracorpuscular, which I explained. Another classification I can, can ask you about would be intravascular and extravascular. Intravascular is destruction of red blood cell in the vessels, and extravascular is destruction of red blood cell in your reticular endothelial system. So extravascular is destruction of red blood cell in your reticular endothelial system, such as spleen, liver, and one other organ. How do you diagnose peripheral smear? You can see fragmented red blood cell because of, of hemolysis. Yes, you can see schistocytes. When you perform 
complete blood count, you see a decrease in red blood cell. You also see an increase in reticulocyte because everything is, you don't have any, um, you have iron, you have um, B12, you have all the ingredients that you need to make red blood cell. It's just that these red blood cells are being destroyed. So your bone marrow will respond by producing a lot of reticulocytes. A very important point you need to mention in hemolytic anemia is jaundice. So you're present to, so if you see a patient that has anemia sign and there's jaundice, you're thinking of hemolysis. So how do you diagnose jaundice? Of course, by a chemical blood analysis. Yes, you check for bilirubin level, LDH level. How do you treat? Of course, this is an emergency case, yes. It's acute anemia. You need to transfuse hydration and treat the etiology. Like what is causing this hemolysis? Malaria can cause hemolysis. Yes, it's malaria. You need to give anti-malaria drugs. Yes, if it's an autoimmune destruction, you need to give glucocorticoids to suppress the immune system. Okay, good. Acquired hemolytic anemia. Acquired hemolytic anemia is hemolysis that is acquired. It's very important, yes. It's mostly diagnostic criteria. How do you diagnose? It's the same thing they're just repeating. You would take, first of all, you start with clinical presentation. You will explain that there will be anemia signs like weakness, fatigue, pallor, and then because it's hemolysis, you're going to see John D's sign, yes, increase in um, bilirubin, yellowing of the eye. What kind of jaundice is this? Is hemolytic jaundice, right? So there'll be dark urine, yellowing of the eyes, so on and so forth. Please, it's very important. What test is the gold standard for autoimmune hemolytic anemia is Combs test. Combs test picks up antibodies against red blood cell. So direct Combs test picks up antibodies on the red blood cell and indirect Combs test picks up antibody in the plasma. Now, what are the classification of autoimmune hemolytic anemia? We have code, code agglutinin hemolytic anemia and warm agglutinin hemolytic anemia. Cold agglutinin, this occurs, this is when a patient presents with anemia in cold region. So when the temperature is between 0 to 5 degrees Celsius. What immunoglobulins or what antibody is causing this hemolysis? Because it's autoimmune process. It means there's an there's antibody production against red blood cell. What antibody is this? IgM. So in cold, it's IgM. Then in warm, it is IgG. Okay, let's go back. So in cold, you can see that it's IgM against red blood cell. And it can be associated with infectious, in infectious disease known as mononucleosis, mycoplasma, Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia, very important. Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. Presentation, there will be cyanosis of the ear, and because it's hemolysis, jaundice, dark urine, weakness, fatigue, pallor, so on and so forth. Then if it's warm, it's IgG antibodies against red blood cell. At what temperature? 37 degrees Celsius. Yes, there's hemolysis, and it's the same presentation. It's just that one occurs during cold and one occurs during hot environment. Hematology exam. As you can see, this is a beautiful slide. As you can see, when you have prolonged PT and normal PT, you can see the causes. Normal PT and prolonged PTT, you can see the causes. And when you have both, you can see the causes. Thank you very much. Please, if I explain something that you liked or something that was difficult for you, you can show your appreciation by subscribing to my YouTube channel. Please, it's very important. Subscribe, like, comment, and share. God bless you, and I wish you good luck in your exams.